Hello, uh, hello all, hello to all. Uh, my name is Jacek Bartosiak, with me Nick Myers, and that would be day two, episode two of our uh, series on the Zapad uh, exercise 2021 that are, you know, sort of going on right as we speak. Hello, Nick. Hello, Jacek. How are you today? I'm fine. How about you? I'm hanging in there. I'm Sunny wet. Reading Russian press releases. Sunny weather in, uh, in in Warsaw, in Poland, beautiful sky, 25 degrees, almost summer, summer weather. Uh, you know, the, 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 the September in 1939, when the war, Second World War started, was extremely hot, dry, and sunny. That actually accommodated the Blitzkrieg a lot, because <laughs> usually it's, it's heavy, you know, it tends to rain in Poland in September. So uh, that would have complicated uh, the Germans' deployments and movements, uh, especially fast movements back back then. But that that was a sort of a side trip back to the his, to the history. And so let's get back to our main uh, subject: Zapat exercise. So Nick, uh, what's going on? What's new on on the table? Uh, you can see behind me the sun. The sky, sunshine has showed up for the day. So I'm not I'm not enjoying that because I've been studying Russian movements the whole time. Uh, so a quick methodological point uh, before I get going into the listing of all the stuff that I found so far. Uh, unlike a lot of the other people who are also posting on Zapa, some of them are doing really excellent work as well. I don't look at the uh, satellite images. I'm more looking at the literal press statements themselves and putting them into context uh, relative to what has been said in the past. Uh, the Russians are notoriously uh, prolix in their release of information, but put no context on any of it so that it can be used uh, in all sorts of ways that usually are more dissembling than otherwise, because it just feels like a giant mass of information. So what I do is I pretty much unpick it. Uh, so I'm not going to say that I have the definitive answers to what is going on, but I can go through what the Russians say is going on. We may need to talk later about what gets proven or disproven subsequently. The first thing I would like to say is a minor correction from yesterday. I had not read his Vestia or Tas yet at the time that we were talking. The Su-30 deployment to Berenovici uh, that Jacek mentioned yesterday did occur and is going to be a permanent deployment as uh, one of those three new combat training centers that Putin and Lukashenko did agree to in March. So they are not part of Zapad itself, but they are obviously in the middle of the terrain. Now, speaking of the terrain, uh, if you let me share the map again, I'd be happy to show where the um, where most of the activity is going on. Um, as I was inferring, the primary uh, places where things are occurring is going to be Molino and Obozlizniesk, Liznovsky uh, near Berenovici in Belarus. Um, that hasn't really changed. There has been a number of details of where, of who is deploying where. So on the macro, macro level, what has appeared to have occurred based on the press release we have seen is that the 6th Army from the St. Petersburg area and the 20th Guards Army, which is based in Varonezh but extends all the way up to Smolensk along the northern side of the Russia-Ukraine border, have both been redeployed to Mulino. Uh, we knew about the 20th Guards Army moving up there because they were doing a whole bunch of uh, tactical exercises of, over the past month. So I'm not, that didn't surprise me, but the 6th Army sort of uh, showed up uh, in the press release kind of late. I think some of the other people have been looking at the satellite imagery have already seen this, but I don't really have time to get to the satellite imagery, so they may have caught up before I did. The 1st Guards Tank Army, curiously, has not been reported in Russian sources. Uh, I thought that it moved to Belarus, and indeed it has, but I can only think, find that in Belarusian sources right now. So no official word on what the first guard tank army has been, but I can say that at least the second guard's motor rifle division is uh, active not in Ubozlovsky itself, but for the south in uh, the Domanovsky uh, polygon right next to it, uh, working with the 38th guard's uh, brigade one of the two special operations brigades of Belarus, which is uh, typically the, the center point of the uh, interoperability that Belarus and Russia have together. Um, going through the larger plot here, 
we can say now definitively that this is going to be a different uh, structured exercise than what Zapa 2017 and then the very similar to Zapa 2017 Union Shield exercise of 2015 and 2019. And both of those, there's a strong emphasis on weeding out a color revolution attempt going on inside the Union state before switching to an offensive after the other side had uh, increased an offensive. This one is a bit more classical in its setup in that there is a perceived attack going on in both overt and hybrid sense. Um, what, I, what I mean by this, the two polygons in Eastern Kaliningrad here are currently going through a classic defensive exercise, tactical exercise. Um, they're identifying forces coming over the border and responding to them. Whereas in the Brest area of Belarus and to a slightly lesser extent over the Grodno one, uh, they are doing active uh, scout searches and finding all sorts of illegal groups moving over the border, according to the scenario, and then subsequently doing all sorts of activities to cut them off and destroy them. These are the only polygons where a defensive tactical level exercise is currently being done. Uh, elsewhere, we are getting all sorts of reports of air defense uh, mo for joint air defense commands being set up between Russia and Belarus. This is pretty common at the start of a Zapad exercise, but they're not being very specific about details of where they are moving to. Uh, we did also get the traditional declaration that, that the Russian Air Force has redeployed a number of its forces to the so-called operational airfields. These are much uh, smaller airfields that are not nearly as uh, are not nearly as uh, attached to logistics as the main operating bases where the order of battle is situated, but allow for a uh, multiplication of targets the enemy would have to do. It appears from the releases that these are concentrated in the Tambov and Ryazan oblasts out here, so southeast of Moscow. I don't know how exclusive that is, but those are the only two locations that are being emphasized here. But those are Su-30s and Su-35s, both of which are fourth generation plus plus fighters. Uh, there's a plenty of other fighters in the Western military district that are unaccounted for as yet. And it claims that the Belarusian Air Force is participating in that, though I have seen no specific evidence for that yet in Belarusian sources or anywhere else to this point, to this time. We also got um, Iskander exercise going on in Luga, Leningrad Oblast, which is also not supposed to, not a, sorry, look at this one, uh, not a declared uh, polygon at the start of the exercise that only emerged as uh, activities began. We also now know that the airborne troops are going to be operating in a couple of different locations. So the 76th Guards Air Assault Division, which is based in Peskov up here, which typically exercises at this polygon here that has been claimed for the exercise is going to be doing airborne descents into Bravginsky and Kaliningrad Oblast, as well as Brescht in uh, the Polish Belarusian border, uh, probably towards the end of the exercise. In addition to which the 106th Guards Airborne Division will be doing its own landing out here in Jitovo Ryazan Oblast, again, southeast of Moscow. We know the 31st Guards Air Assault Brigade, which is the only unit from the Central Military District that has yet been overtly mentioned in Russian sources, has also already moved to Bulino, uh, in Nizhny Novgorod Oblast, where most of the international, um, in, international component in Russia is. So that will be exercising out there. They're using the new type of um, airborne tactics, or air assault tactics that We'll have to see what further details are released on that over the course of the next couple of days. Um, and then the 98th Guards Airborne Division, which is the last Western Military District Air, uh, Airborne Troops Force, uh, which is based out here in Ivanova Oblast, uh, in, here's Ivanova Oblast, and uh, straddles into Yaroslav Oblast in Kostroma Oblast, is doing a completely separate exercise with the Belarusian. Uh, with the Belarusian 5th Spetsnaz Brigade, uh, where they're doing their own uh, descent activities out in that region, 
uh, officially not part of Zappa, that ends, I believe, today on the 11th. I think I mistakenly mentioned that it ended yesterday, uh, a couple of days ago on the previous recording, but now that's still ongoing and probably finishing up just about now, actually. So as we look through that, the airborne troops in the West are fully committed, uh, but we only have one central military district force brought in. Next, an interesting detail to this point, there has been other than that one brigade, no other forces from outside the Western military district that have been overtly activated according to the Russians for this exercise yet. There may be activities going on that we don't, that are being registered in all sorts of uh, other open source activities, but they are not acknowledged by the government for this time. Uh, but what is curious is that in the Southern military district, the Crimea, the Crimea air defense did do an S-400 exercise in the first day, again, nothing to do with Zafid specifically. The Eastern Military District uh, saw a couple of communications inspections, uh, possibly running a larger C2, um, C2 check. Uh, the Central Military District actually sent a couple of fighters to uh, the Eastern Military District on Thursday, so the day before the exercise formally began, uh, this is for routine missile training, uh, missile launch training or live fire type scenario, but still moving farther away from Zafad. And then perhaps most curiously in the Northern Military District, they announced a large scale overt command and control exercise to protect national security and mar Russian maritime activities, commercial maritime activities in the Arctic. Um, they currently have their Arctic Expeditionary Force in Bikinka, uh, where, of course, the emergency situations minister died of, in an accident earlier this week. Uh, but the primary activity that's been registered for that exercise so far is the facilitation of forces leaving the base, doing all sorts of anti-saboteur actions in case there were soft coming in to disable the ships before they left, and uh, mine sweeping to ensure that the Kola Bay was open for the larger ships to escape. So we should see a fairly large Arctic exercise happening simultaneously to this. That's probably gonna add into the official 200,000 troop number that the Russians have claimed, but the Arctic exercise itself only claims to have 8,000 total. So I, I'm not entirely sure they're gonna get to 200,000 magically, but even Vostok 2018 which is huge. You could only add up like 40,000 out of whatever hundreds of thousands they claimed were going on through the overt motion, through the overt actions. Um, there's been a variety of other declarations of uh, Russian reconnaissance going on up and down at the front line of Belarus, but that are, those are the main headlines that I would focus on for this first day. As you're starting to see the trend of this map here, the uh, logo instead of the flag is for all the places where both the Russians and the Belarusians are active. We see a pretty big emphasis on the Brezh area of Belarus, in that southwest corner, and in addition to Molino and further back. Um, I'm not sure how it's going to, if it's going to remain confined to that area, but that's where we are at the moment. So with, um, lastly, the Baltic fleet did deploy some ships, but there's been no serious details put out yet. We just know that um, there's almost certainly going to be a joint Baltic Northern fleet, uh, De Santa Emilia, which is this far Western uh, map here, but that has not yet been declared. But there's, that's where we are. It's looking a bit different, a little more classical of an exercise, but still very spread out at this time. Okay, next, Jess, we, you know, we, you have uh, described in detail the deployments and the activities and probably even intentions of uh, the Russians and Belarusians exercising. But now, you know, let's imagine, you know, not to imagine, we're speaking to the general public. How would you translate those developments into the great uh, narrative or you know what it means and what does it signal uh, what we could uh, anticipate by this way of exercising how we should so read the, it so the first thing that 
uh, we need to emphasize here, and this is not a mystery, is that the First Guards tank army is the principal cooperating force that the Russians have with the Belarusian armed forces. Uh, again, like this is not a surprise. Everybody should have known this before, but it's now pretty blatant that in an exercise where Lukashenko seems much more open to letting the Russians come into Belarus, it's still only the First Guards tank army operating there. So that's, that would be perhaps the most important, but least surprising point at, at first. The second thing that I find curious is that the huge geographical range of this exercise. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll pull up like, here's the 2017 map again and the 2013 map again. Molino is basically doing its own sideshow. Um, just indicates that the Russians are anticipating that any type of exercise, well, in, any type of military operation that's going to involve a large scale conflict as anything involving 20,000 troops is going to do, even if it's not necessarily a high intensity at any point, it's simply a, a, wide, a, a wide range of crisis management situation, is going to have to revolve around forces uh, being able to act independently as well as being able to join together to do uh, large-scale activities. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be most curious to see uh, at the end of this exercise to this point, is to what extent do they continue to do uh, tactics similar to the, this mobile echelon that they did in Kavkaz 2020, which was really designed uh, to have a large combat unit operating essentially without a front line, uh, but being able to move into an, into an area that required Russian presence and more or less support itself uh, until it was able to find a, a new airfield from which, uh, a new airfield from which it could receive more logistics or even continuously create its own uh, air resupply options along the way while protecting itself from all sorts of uh, DRG activity going on around it. DRG is the Russian acronym for effectively what the West would just call soft infiltration or special operations forces, for those who don't need more acronyms in their lives. Those are the two big things I would take away. The third, perhaps somewhat less important because it seems obvious, though to me it's still a surprise because it's a change from the past couple of, from, from the previous output is that the air defense component of this exercise is already registering an enormous quantity of targets that had to be shot down. Um, I think they said that they took out, they notionally took out 50 uh, enemy aircraft, which is about reasonable for the beginning of a NATO operation with an almost standing start. Um, and then in addition to which the redeployment of the of the aircraft operational airfields that at least in the overt sense are east of Moscow, southeast of Moscow, uh, about in contrast to Zapa 2017, when the Russian Air Force basically started doing all sorts of air interception operations all over the Western Military District and into Belarus itself uh, from the beginning, suggests that they are, they are um, trying to figure out what they would do if this was a conventional war right from the start. Um, and again, there's been sort of the discussion that this was always the case in the past, but I would strongly contend that that was not the scenario being operated in the 2015 to 2019 major Russia-Belarus exercises. So what we're seeing now is much closer to how the Russians anticipate a true uh, Russia-NATO war over a fairly isolated couple of instances would emerge. Uh, that, and this is, that is to say that it's not a color revolution scenario. Uh, this is how do we manage to maintain both a forward defensive posture while also doing some extremely uh, disparate counteroffensives in or probably against strate um, strategic as opposed to territorial based targets. Uh, we'll see a couple of more details of that come out over the next couple of days, especially if we see any deployment away from what we know uh, of the units that are currently massed there, or we just get more details as to what exact what tactics they're actually practicing at Molino. But at the moment, um, 
what's typically the most exciting part of the early phases of Zapad is has not materialized yet. And that is, how do the Russians attempt to weed out fifth columnists within the country, uh, Russians and Belarusians? And the fact that we're not seeing that to this point suggests that this is a completely different scenario. Mm. Yeah, fascinating. So in a way, uh, the, I understand that your assessment is that the way the Russians and Belarusians exercise this year is a um, confirmation of uh, their recognition that the, 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 the warfare is transforming towards the uh, separate pockets, uh, everything happening at the same time with, without no front lines, without mass. Uh, it's not echeloned properly, but it's quite chaotic, rapid, and involving wide... Uh, uh, not only all domains, but also wide areas and wide uh, wide swaths of, of uh, territory. Is that what you were trying to convey? Yeah. Yes, I think we saw a huge switch to that focus in Kafkaz 2020 after doing it on a smaller scale in both Vostok 2018 and Sindh 2019. Uh, but this is now the movement of those concepts from Kafkaz last year into the Western Military District this year. But would that mean that they are afraid of the high precision warfare uh, by the West, by Poland, by the Baltic states, by Ukraine? How would you read that particular aspect? Is it in fear of the, of the information dominance, uh, precision warfare capabilities of the West as a whole? Or maybe there is some other reasoning behind it? Because, you know, Poland yeah. itself doesn't have this precision capability or Baltic states or Ukrainians, so. There are two dimensions to that answer. Uh, on the first level, you'd almost be tempted to say, you'd almost be tempted to say no in as much as the loudest part of the initial phase of this exercise is the extremely traditional nature of the territorial defense that is going on in the uh, Resht Voblist in Belarus and in Kaliningrad Oblast in, in Russia, um, which would, though in, in the Belarus scenario, the, the, the Belarusian portion of that, they are scripting in that the enemy is sneaking across the border. But again, like if you imagine that they're sneaking across the border, there has to be some degree of suppression the ability to detect that activity is happening at the border in the first place. And on an ordinary day, the Belarusian government would be able to see this going on through a whole bunch of unmanned systems and would understand that something's going, something is happening. Um, on the other hand, though, the, front, the, the, the initial idea for the deployment of uh, the, air the air defenses, which they I, I need to mention again, they have not put a position where the air defense exercises are specifically being oriented. So presumably they're just happening around uh, where the other units are, was to protect the command posts there. Um, now the Russians will talk up a big game about how great the Pantsir system is for this. And um, they typically put them in protection of S-400 units as well as the actual C-2 nodes. But regardless of whether or not that's actually an overinflated thing, overinflated capability or not, I would have thought that they would say more about that if they were actually quite worried about these precision capabilities coming at them. Um, this is part of my initial confusion here, which will probably wear off in the next day as we see more details come out, is whether or not NATO was actually in, in this particular scenario whether or not the big bad West is actually coming in with a huge offensive to start, uh, or if they're able to gradually moderate, modulate their way into, uh, a, into the situation under the assumption that the war is being kicked off by an irrational or less than Russia's standard of rational actor. Um, and for that, I would, I would make reference here to the fact that the Russians the Russian propaganda over the past couple of months, the past three months especially, but they've said this in the they said this beforehand, is that Ukraine, the government in Kiev, is a 
practically a rogue state that wants a war in Eastern Europe. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if that's sort of what they're responding to is what if a country like Kiev that doesn't necessarily have a whole bunch of capability or literally destroy Russia suddenly decided to massively escalate on its own in order to try to decisively win the battle, the, the war in the Donbass or take back Crimea even. And so you have that sort of gap in which uh, you don't know just how, how high this war is going to escalate. Uh, that is one option. Uh, that, would also that would also compete with my original thought a couple of months ago that the uh, Zaba 2021 was going to focus on what the Russians call the Southwestern uh, strategic direction, which is principally about Ukraine, um, which would still make sense if they were organizing everything around the uh, Poganova, Oblast, uh, Poganova polygon, which is uh, this one down here in Varonezh Oblast. But I have yet to hear anything coming out of the exercise about this yet. Maybe they'll switch over to a huge Ukraine focus for the second half overtly. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see. But that's that would be my speculation at this point. But I would have. I would emphasize that is just speculation for right now. Okay, fair enough. And you know, would would, would you dare to assess the, the Polish uh, reaction to the Zapata exercises, Nick? So I have seen references cropping up inside of the Russian news, and that sounds like oh, that would be such a generic thing to say. But usually the Russians don't care what the uh, Polish uh, military is doing by itself. Um, and that's, that has been different this time. They have noticed the uh, 12th mechanized division being moved forward um, into the east. Not in a loud sense. It's not like creeping into official statements yet, but it is certainly getting into uh, the standard body of uh, ed educated Russians who, or at least, engaged in this subject of Russians who like to blog about these details. So it, it has registered. I have yet to see anything about an adjustment to what the exercise would be about um, be, because of this, which for a whole bunch of administrative reasons would be kind of extreme to suddenly change the scripting now. Uh, though they certainly would have the option to do so. But um, Perhaps the most interesting component to it is how quiet the Russians themselves have been about how much force they have actually moved into Belarus itself. Now, officially, if I remember correctly, it's 2,600 Russians and 50 Kazakh troops who are moving uh, into Belarus, Belarus. And they're supposed to be mostly in that Obos, Luz, the Polygon, though, there's evidence that they've gone to a number of the other ones as well. They, at the bare minimum, there were uh, VDV reconnaissance troops at uh, the two four ones in Grodno and in Resch uh, that are sorting out where the uh, descent landing is going to be later on during Zabad. Um, but the fact that they are not playing up the fact that the Russian army is inside of Belarus right now uh, in stark contrast to how Zapa 2013 worked, where pretty much the only story that they were talking about was the Russians inside of Belarus, um, in addition to the infamous Belarusian amphibious landings as such a necessary uh, task that the Belarusians need to know. Uh, the fact that that was the only emphasis in the past, but now it's very much a muted dimension to this exercise, does suggest that um, they don't want to escalate things further. And I would say at large, if you compare Zappa 2021 to Zappa 2017, it's pretty easy to see that this is not the beginning of an attack or an occupation of Belarus. If that was going to be the case, then it would be a huge dramatic movement of forces that we're gonna to have to see over the next couple of days um, in a way that I think is like, nigh on impossible at this point, since they have such a uh, large international dimension to this, they have so much committed logistics. Whereas in 2017, until it was made clear that this was going to be a pretty small uh, Russian movement in there, it was at least debatable uh, that they were going to be moving in and potentially causing a larger geopolitical, thing, geopolitical uh, action 
with the, of course, the caveats that were pointed out at the time that we're not bringing nearly enough logistics uh, in advance in order to accomplish that sort, that sort of operation. So in that sense, there is some impact going on from improved Polish preparations that the Russians are a lot more overt that this is not supposed to be read in any way as provocative uh, for a, for a uh, crisis happening during the week of this exercise itself. Um, but I'm not entirely sure that that wasn't always what they intended to do. <laughs> Yeah, of uh, of the developments over the, the next days, we will be talking, as promised. Uh, so maybe that would be uh, it for now. What do you think, Nick? So I think this is a good place I need to move off for now. We'll have more details as to what's happening next, probably tomorrow, if all sure. this way. Exactly. So let's uh, let's uh, save some information for tomorrow for episode three. So this is all for today. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my guest was uh, Nicholas Myers. Uh, I am Jacek Bartosiak, Strategy and Future, and we have been covering the Zapat exercises uh, every day, one episode. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Yasser. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm.